uh, our first speaker is Francisco, Francisco Javier Naranjo. Yes, this one. Right. Uh, and Francisco is uh, teaching Spanish uh, here at Lincoln. And following Francisco, we have John, John Nevada, who's from uh, Kagoshima University. He's come a long way to shop this morning, John. It's been an early start. Um, so, uh, um, we're going to have a short Q&A um, after we speak, uh, after Francisco. Um, but we're planning to end at 3.25, which still means we have 15 minutes left, so we can continue the discussion afterwards, if you so wish. Um, Francisco, over you, sir. It's nice to meet you. So, my name is Francisco, so I was born in Chile. And uh, pretty much I developed this when I was working for Melbourne University in the Center for Program Evaluation they had. I took part in a research project there, so I somehow recycled some of the ideas, the way of thinking, and then I developed my own project that was my graduation thesis. So, first of all, the topic is accountability in education, and basically the importance of this is quite obvious because, well, it can be documented from two perspectives, which is the main topic here. We have an audit on our social focus perspective. So my research was mainly focusing on the social aspects of accountability, which are mainly uh, used a lot in general evaluation and not in language program evaluation, because of basically it's stakeholders. So accountability is important because of stakeholders. Stakeholders can understand what is going on, what's going on, what, what the current situation of the evaluant or the educational institution is like when the project is uh, executed. And it's oftentimes interpreted as evidence for quality, which is very, very important to understand what, why people think so. And then it can be quantified, arguably. So this quantification is pretty much the motivation to start exploring accountability from a social perspective and not from a purely audit-focused approach. So we have these two uh, perspectives, the audit focus, which is the classical one, classic theory, um, pretty much uh, Rhea Dickens, Kylie Lynch, and then we've got the social focus, which comes from general evaluation, so human resources management, asset management, and uh, related areas. So, uh, the audit focus approach, well, classical evaluation theory, Kylie and Rhea Dickens, Lynch, Rhea Dickens and Germain, basically they are talking about utilization, identifi the identification of problem in areas within an um, educational institution. And, well, they think that if you identify a problem, you can solve it. And if you solve your problem, you can improve. So, that was the main idea behind this. Then, of course, this leads to a standardization of the curriculum. Because if you standardize, you can compare. If you can compare, then you can somehow establish a benchmark and say, we are doing well, we're not doing quite well. So that's pretty much the, the, the main idea here. This leads, of course, to, leads to a sense of uniformity. So everyone is doing basically the same thing. So we can compare. If school A is doing the same, school B is going to be doing the same, and so on. So we can compare how both all the group of institutions um, is performing. And then here, well, evaluants, which is an institution, can be compared, but this is a little bit contradictory because if we check evaluation um, theory and literature, they talk about the uniqueness of the evaluant. So how can you compare things that are different? That's where this approach fails. That's failing. So the issues, definition of the evaluant, the scope of relevance, how to define your education institution, because it's not just about uh, picking up people and saying, oh, this is my venue. You have to decide, you have to carefully evaluate the situation and then make decisions. Then, oftentimes it's weaponized. So they use the results and say, oh, this class is not performing, this department is underperforming, we have to do this, we have to do that. Um, and then, can the evaluator flesh out the evaluator's context? Because usually this is performed by an external party. But is this person actually accessing the situation from a general perspective? Is the person talking with, with, with those involved? So those are the main issues that are affecting this uh, evaluation as a practice. So, then we also have this. Um, 
the uniqueness of the evaluation, can we generalize and standardize? Can you really standardize and compare to things that are unique? What about the context? Who are your stakeholders? So who are your participants? Who are you? Who is uh, the people that are being interviewed? Can you compare the evaluations, like a place A and place B? These are departments, one evaluation, or is each class one independent universe? Those are questions that need to be solved and addressed. And then how does context affect reality? Very, very important, because oftentimes we receive guidance from, from ministries, and then we have to use that. But it's not the same if I'm working, for example, with talented students, and if I'm doing so with students with special needs. I need to find a way to somehow articulate my curriculum, but the context is not going to be the same, because I do not have the same participants, or I may not have the same set of tools. Therefore, what happened then is that we have this social focus approach, which is something that Norris mentioned in 2016 when he published his paper, Language Program Evaluation. After 10 years or so, 15 uh, years of uh, lack of research, he published this paper, and he somehow started talking about the relevance of reactions, the relevance of relationships within schools, within evaluants, in a way that, uh, well, so as to explore and so as to find out what the real problems are aware. Then of course we focus on the social dynamics and their results. So it's more about interaction, it's about a reactive process, how my teachers, how my academics are reacting to these guidelines, what's happening after that. And then it's used of course in evaluation in other subfields, general evaluation, human resources, and of course in education. Here, this is mentioned in education by Adam Selman Weaver, Preston and Boyle, and they refer to this as local ways of doing, which is pretty much what happens when we, when each department decides how to articulate the group. So we've been uh, witnessing this problem, but no one has been actually addressing the issue and using this, the findings when uh, conducting evaluations, practical evaluation projects. So then, um, what happened next is that um, Paul Grover, um, Monica Cardenas Claros, Suguro, and Rick, they developed a new framework. So they just scrapped information from classical theory from evaluation, and then they used social theory to create a new framework. This is called the argument based approach to evaluation. It has not been used, it's just theory. So I used it uh, when writing my, my thesis. It was a little bit problematic because we were using testing theory, we were applying Keynes framework to evaluation, basically to justify the decisions. Because when he introduced his project, there was a lot of resistance. Evaluation was based on numbers and collecting data, analyzing interviewing people. But then he said, we need to explore relationships. And some academics were like, well, wait a second, why are you doing this? So why are you changing the picture? So the main idea here is that no assumptions are made. The results reflect the evaluant as a fluid entity. So you just access the place, you interview absolutely everyone, and then you get an idea of what is going on. So you just go there, interview all the participants, and based on what they're telling you, you get an idea of what the problem is. It's not about going there and saying, these are my stakeholders, I'm going to be interviewing these people, these people, but not these participants. You need to interview everyone. And then, of course, the idea is that this will foster utilization and improvement by involvement. If you interview everyone, if everyone feels that they can share their opinion, then they will listen to what you have to say. Which is also something that we may find in the literature, especially in Kyrie's work. He talks a lot about uh, getting involvement. And also, Patton has developed a lot of papers on utilization in this field. So they were making use of this to develop this social based approach. Approach. So, why should we revise as well the notion of stakeholders? Because of all this, so there is evidence for the effects of social stratification or organizational values. If you check Lyndon Gray, she wrote an interesting paper. She talks about how people, how people's um, idea of the managers affected the way they reacted to managers' requests in a school. So, if you dislike, for example, your coordinator whatever he asks you to do, you're not going to have the same reaction as if you like that person from the very beginning. That's, that's, a, that's her take. Then, of course, this uh, can uh, create an improper or lead to an improper identification of attitudes. 
this is very important because if your teacher or if someone is angry, the way the class is going to be conducted may not be the best, or if they do not believe in the curriculum. If you give them something and you think you're like, I don't like this, I don't think this is going to be useful, then you may transmit those vibes to your students, and that can somehow undermine or destroy the entire education project. And then of course we have this from very practical positions to inside to actions, because usually uh, the curriculum is developed by institutions at a high level, and then they just pass it over and say, please use this. So if we pay attention to who our stakeholders are, we could be accessing or getting information from those who can really give us something that we can utilize to create a meaningful curriculum. Academics are stakeholders, yes. Administrative staff are stakeholders, yes. Students and of course the community, everyone is a stakeholder. Because we work with them, it's pointless to ignore, for example, administrative uh, staff because we need them to keep their educational venue operating. So they need to know the limitations of the curriculum. They need to know what we are doing. Everyone needs to know what's going on there. So, uh, Bob Grover used this framework. He adapted it from Akanan and Eden, which is from Human Resources. So you've got power and interest. And depending on how powerful someone is and how interested someone is in the topic, you're going to have different roles. So if someone is really powerful and interested, it's going to be a player. So a player can be, for example, a manager, or maybe the school director, anyone. Subject, someone who has high interest but has no power, usually what happens with teachers. You're highly interested in improving the situation, but you don't have enough power to make changes, so you'll be a subject. If there is low interest and no power, they become proud. What can happen with students if they're not involved? They just follow what, whatever anyone's saying. And then if someone is really powerful but has low interest, that person can be labeled as a context setter because they can use the power to set goals. But if they're not interested, they may not want to change or do anything according to the context. So that being said, how do we group the stakeholders? So we have three levels, the macro level, meso level, and micro level. Do you understand this? Yes. Okay. So for the macro level, of course, um, we've got policy making, goal setting, needing a reality check sometimes, and a standardization. So usually at this level, this is probably the most important, delivering standardized results, which was the main issue at Melbourne Uni. They really liked standardized results. So this created clashes because academics said, we cannot somehow standardize that. So they had to find a way to quantify results, and that led to other issues. Then the meso level as a mediator, interpreting and buffering office policies and reiteration of goals. Because usually when you are in charge of a department, you receive a document and you need to think about a way to translate that into a specific actions. You need to, of course, uh, this is very important, office politics, because we have to talk with people and we need to make sure that the department is working, that if someone dislikes something, that doesn't create any further problems as well. And also, we are mediator because, um, if you're sorry, you are mediator if you're working in that level because you need to deal with the higher level and also with your teachers. Then, micro-level actions, articulation, articulating the curriculum directly and checking the feasibility. Probably the most important one is this, because when we are in the classroom, we receive goals and then we have to think about specific ways to uh, carry out the activities. So, of course, these create problems. And then, how can we benefit our students with all this? Well, first of all, participation, because if everyone is taking part, in this project, if you are talking with teachers, with managers, and with policy makers, then you can improve everything. That sounds quite obvious, but it's not uh, like that sometimes. Then you can identify problem areas or problematic areas directly, because it's not the same when someone in the ministry says this is an issue, and when someone who is working with students identifies something different. Sometimes the perspectives are not equivalence or they clash for some reason. So if you gather everyone, then you can discuss or you can triangulate opinions 
to get a better picture of what the problem is. Sometimes policymakers say, oh, we have an issue with materials, so they send more materials. But actually, that's not the problem. The problem is that the school is isolated, so they need to move the materials from the warehouse to, this, to the location. So you, they would not be solving the problem by just dumping in more material. They need to find where the problem is located. Then, after that, what is the value I'm doing to satisfy your guidelines as well? This is related to the uh, dynamic social aspects. So this refers to specific actions. Sometimes, due to limitations in terms of money, in terms of infrastructure, it's not quite clear what people are doing, what, are they, what an institution could be doing. But we have to ask the question, because sometimes, due to limitations in terms of money, the actions do not seem quite obvious. The actions they are trying to comply, they're trying to be, account be held accountable for their actions, but they cannot because of other factors. So that's also something that should be explored. Then, are there any indigenous guidelines? Is there anything that the department or the institution has been doing on their own in order to comply with these regulations? That also needs to be explored because it affects everything. Then, do we have any clusters? Very important. Is, for example, the policy contradicting reality? Is the policy uh, doable? Is it real? Or is it just a bunch of regulations that cannot be uh, translated into specific actions? And then, also, are there any positive or negative leaders, which is really, really important in educational values? So, this is a, the practical example. So I accessed the Department of Japanese Language Education. I did that because uh, my first degree was in Japanese. And I felt comfortable because uh, they could communicate what they were really thinking without having to use English. So Melbourne Uni operates in English. So they felt a little bit threatened because of the interviews. They didn't want to, anyone to understand what their opinions were. So when we conducted the interviews, uh, they could use Japanese. I was just there interviewing them. They could use Japanese or English, and then, uh, thanks to my knowledge of the culture, I could really somehow understand what they were trying to say, and then I asked follow-up questions. So I pretty much interviewed uh, all the teachers. I could not access the students. The university didn't let me do that. They said, no, you can do whatever you want, but don't talk to students. <laughs> there was a reason for that, of course. <laughs> um, it's because of this. There was a dissociation between the macro, meso, and micro level expectations. So my macro level um, participant was the manager of this department, the head of the language department. She let me read all the policy. We discussed it. But then she told me so that when they had to translate all of these guidelines into actions, it didn't make any sense because the university wanted to use a standardized testing for language from year one. And she was like, how am I supposed to be making students sit for a test if they don't know how to speak the language. The results are going to be horrible. So they were having their own problems there. And, of course, at micro level, I could not access the students, but I could uh, interview teachers. And most of the teachers were not happy, of course, because of this. They told me, um, I have to deal with students who feel frustrated because they have to answer this test, answer these questions, and they cannot answer the questions because they don't know enough Japanese but I have to uh, make them to this anyway. So what they did to solve this problem, they had uh, two, three sessions. The teachers prepared a lot of extra material that was not included in the, in the, in the syllabus, in the official syllabus provided by, by the university. Because this university uses a centralized system, so everything is prepared by a central office and then the departments just receive guidelines. Do this, do this, do this, and then the department has to translate that into specific actions. But the syllabus is prepared by a centralized office. Then, of course, um, attitudes were crucial to identify their problems because people were not happy. They were really, really uh, frustrated. More than angry, they were frustrated. And, well, to deal with all this, because of the, this new framework, I had to develop um, a coding scheme. What I did, I prepared interviews using the literature, so standard theory. And based on what people were answering, 
I develop a coding skill. And basically what I could find, what I could find, sorry, was that people were angry and that also their roles were not quite specific within the organization. Some people told me, I don't know what I'm what I am supposed to be doing. My contract says that I am a teacher, but I'm managing my colleagues. So she told me, I don't know why I am supposed to be doing this. So we found a lot, I found a lot of percolation. People who had different roles, but they didn't know very well why they were doing that. And then what I did after that, well, I just reported my findings to all the stakeholders so that they could make use of that. It was quite transparent, so we had an agreement with the macro level participants. I told them, I'm not going to be revealing uh, my participants' names, of course, but I'm going to be giving you all the information and I'm going to give them all the information as well. So everyone could read absolutely everything. And then after that, of course, I received some emails. They were happy because they said, oh, this is exactly what I meant. Thank you very much for pointing this out. And other people wanted to meet me because they wanted to somehow hear what I had to say because I had observed the situation, what I could suggest as, as an external, as a third party. Of course, I didn't make any suggestions because I was just exploring. This was a thesis. It was not a, a page uh, evaluation project. But basically, that's, uh, that's what I could do. In terms of the framework, or robust framework, which comes from testing, it's just a way to analyze data and to link inferences. So basically, what he argues is that you can collect data from any source. And then, the most important thing is how you link all that to your argument. So your argument is improvement. I'm going to improve this venue, this educational venue, and this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to be using this information because of this. I'm going to be using these participants because of this. So that's the crucial for the main point here. So, in terms of, well, conclusions, of course, accountability goes beyond compliance. And when I explore this venue, that was demonstrated. Because people were taking action, but they were not satisfying the requirements established by the institution, which was give me a test score, give me a test score. They were not doing that. Some teachers were worried about students learning. So one of my uh, participants, she said that students had to memorize 500 characters, kanji characters. But one of the students couldn't handle that. For some reason, the student tried, 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 but couldn't memorize the kanji. So she said, well, in his case, um, I just made sure that he could do something he could handle. So she was more worried about the students, uh, the students' learning process than about what the university was demanding from, from her as a teacher. So she adjusted grades accordingly and tried to help these, these students. And then, of course, accountability depends on what people understand. What people understand of it. Sorry, I said that. Understand of it. And uh, yes, quite obvious. So basically, here, based on my experience. Um, the head of the department, she was quite realistic. She knew she had a problem with these guidelines. So she tried to make it real, and she tried to prevent headaches to absolutely everyone. So she was quite nice, I must say. That's my personal opinion. And then, of course, she was interested in improving, in helping everyone participate. So she told me, I'm not going to be censoring anyone. So just interview all the staff. I don't mind. I'm going to authorize all the interviews. So I just went there, said yes. She signed all the papers. We could not interview students because the university opposed. But the manager, the school manager said, you can do whatever you want. The head of the department said, yes, you can do whatever you want as long as the university is, is fine with it. Yes. So basically, that's, that's what the project was about. And um, it was really interesting to see uh, theory in action, because <laughs> you read a lot. There's a lot of, when you're reading, everything is theoretical, but then you notice that this is, this is actually happening. And now, um, it's not here, but Guruva uh, now is developing an extra level here, which is called nano level. He, he thinks that we should isolate teachers from students. They should not be, they should not be regarded as the same, as the same layer. Because as a teacher, you have more power than your students. So you cannot be at the same level in terms of how you react and how you understand the language. So she argues, he argues sorry, that 
it should be another layer here called nano level. There's another one of my former classmates now is working on a PhD trying to demonstrate the existence of the nano level with data. So that's it. Thank you. And Francisco, your timing was absolutely perfect. Uh, we have six or seven minutes. Uh, does anyone have any questions in the